John Challing here for Dialogue on Public Issues at Campbellsville University. And once again, we're continuing our series of campaign interviews with candidates in the Tuesday, November 5th general election here in Kentucky. And today we're very honored and pleased to be interviewing the Democratic Party nominee for Kentucky Secretary of State, Ms. Heather French Henry. Welcome. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you so much. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Wow, well that's a lot to tell. <laughs> um, I'm originally from Augusta and Maysville, Kentucky mm -hmm. in Bracken and Mason County and have spent the last 20 years working um, at the local, state, and national level on behalf of our military heroes. Most people know my dad is a Vietnam veteran who served in the Marine Corps, mm -hmm. uh, was wounded in Vietnam, came home with a lot of extreme issues, as did my uncle as well. So being raised in a military family, that had quite a ripple effect on us. And so when I became your Miss America in 2000, after half a decade of competing to get there, <laughs> um, not only did it pay for my college education, which I got an undergraduate and a master's in design from University of Cincinnati, but it also put me on a platform to take our mm -hmm. uh, military family story on a national perspective and so we were able to work with the President, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Veterans Affairs, Secretary of Labor mm -hmm. on a whole host of veterans initiatives legislatively and also working with civic organizations like the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans and really bringing all of those issues to the forefront. It was really my first entree into what government could really do, mm -hmm. partnering with community-based organizations to make a difference for our military heroes. And so I continued to pound that pavement when I came home from that wonderful year and utilized all those experiences working with the Kentucky Legislature to advocate for more programs through the Kentucky Department of Veterans Affairs. And in 2014, Governor Bashir asked me to become the commissioner mm -hmm. of that department, and then Governor Bevan asked me to stay on as deputy commissioner. Uh, that department is one of the largest under the executive branch. It's actually larger than the Department of Agriculture, for which there's a constitutional officer elected. Mm -hmm. um, so you're looking at a department that's 900 employees, four state veterans nursing homes, five state veterans cemeteries, $102 million budget. Um, we also work on the legislative agenda every legislative session. 120 counties worth of programs and services for not only disability and benefits for veterans, but also women veterans and homeless veterans alike. So I've spent the last five years uh, working in that capacity in government leading those departments. So you've let, you've worked under two successive governors of opposite parties or different parties. I have, which is very interesting. When you come from mm -hmm. a military family, you're sort of raised to learn how to meet your objective, no mm -hmm. matter what the field a yes. battle sort of is. And so if you take that into government, being able to work under a Democratic and a Republican governor mm -hmm. and still being able to meet your objective of serving your population of people and that being our military veterans and their families, whether they're 18 to 118. There's a, a great depth and breadth to that department and, and it extends beyond politics. And that's really one of the reasons why I chose to run for Secretary of State because it is a like role. Mm -hmm. um, although there is a partisan race, it really is a ministerial office. Um, you're not there to be discretionary in how you lead it. You're there to fundamentally do the job for the people as set forth for that office. And so I see myself as having the experience of being able to meet those objectives no matter what the environment is. Mm -hmm. You've answered this, touched on it just briefly in your uh, response just now, but why did you choose in 2019 to jump into the Secretary of State's race? It was not a, a, in a light consideration uh, that I jumped in that wholeheartedly. Um, I was in a very comfortable position at mm -hmm. the Kentucky Department of Veterans Affairs, but we had had a lot of partnerships with the Secretary of State's mm -hmm. office um, as commissioner and deputy commissioner. One of those was creating polling locations in some of our veterans nursing homes, for which we have four across the state. And what that did for us, it was a win-win situation. Not only were we able to provide uh, better access to uh, the polls for those residents in those nursing homes, and of all the people that should have the greatest access certainly should be our military and our veterans, but we also were able to get the community to come into our veterans nursing homes. Uh, a lot of county clerks are constantly looking for uh, better accessible, handicap accessible locations for their polls, and so uh, we saw our veterans nursing homes as being able to be a win-win situation for mm -hmm. both our department and the Secretary of State and the county clerks and the State Board of Elections, and we're able to navigate that process. And then even before I became commissioner, I helped to advocate for the passage of uh, Senate Bill 1, which was the Military Overseas Voting Act. Mm -hmm. And that actually is run through the Secretary of State's office to offer streamlined service for voting for our overseas military and their families. And so fundamentally, working on the election side of things, 
I really feel like I got a very inside look at what some of the dynamics are within the Secretary of State's office as the chief election official in working with the State Board of Elections to fundamentally make change in the communities for populations of people. And then on the business side, which a lot of people don't realize when you talk about Secretary of State, that the largest component of the Secretary of State's office being uh, the fiscal impact and then also personnel-wise mm -hmm. is the business administration component. I'm a small business owner obviously had to go through the Secretary of State's office to register the business every year, have to file, certainly. And so navigating that process as a new business owner was very difficult for me when I first mm -hmm. started. And I had a lot of concerns about resources and able to grow. And I've seen those and heard those echoed on the campaign trail from other business owners as well. But from a veteran standpoint, at KDVA, we were able to partner with the Secretary of State to champion uh, the Boots to Business, which took a couple legislative sessions to pass, and that provides uh, veteran-owned businesses who start a business to offer free filing fees for the first few years. And then we were able then to advocate also through the Department of Finance for service disabled veteran owned business accreditation. And that is um, enveloped into the committee that also provides accreditation for women and minority owned businesses. Mm -hmm. And I sat on that committee for a little over two years. And that again provides that special niche population or populations the ability to one advertise that they officially are that type of entity and then also if you cross state lines and there's a point system for contract uh, work in other state governments then that puts you in a priority status so again it's fundamentally helping our businesses get a hand up not a handout mm -hmm. uh, to be able to offer room for growth um, I certainly would like to see some additional services uh, being offered through the Small Business ad, uh, Administration and then also through Chambers of Commerce across the state providing partnerships but we were able to help advocate and make some changes there and then on the historic aspect so I have this special pin on mm -hmm. which some of the women out there will recognize it's a DAR pin so okay. I'm a daughter of the American Revolution yes. my great-grandfather seven generations ago mm -hmm. founded Augusta Kentucky okay. in 1795 and then went on to found Middletown Kentucky uh, the year a year later and all of the historic land grants uh, that form Kentucky are all archived and digitized through the Kentucky Land Office under the Secretary of State's office. Mm -hmm. So it's vitally important for me when we talk about our state's history to be able to, in a more cost-effective way, sometimes even cost-neutral, be able to develop programs that we can push this information out. And I have a lot of experience developing and implementing programs through the Kentucky Department of Veterans Affairs um, to be able to design and, and create something in a fun, energetic way to maybe partner with our schools, our civics teachers, history teachers, mm -hmm. and being able to push that information out so that people understand the vital documents that are housed there, and maybe they'll see the light of day for the first time in a long time. Now, what are the primary duties? You've touched on those, but mm -hmm. in succinct form, what are the duties of the Secretary of State? So, as outlined in the budget by the right. legislature, uh, you're looking at elections, mm -hmm. so you're the chief election official. Right. Then you also have uh, business administration, okay. and then you have the Kentucky Land Office. So those okay. three components, and each one of those hosts a multitude of other subcategories. Sure. Uh, certainly, sure. most people think of the Secretary of State um, really by and part only as elections, exactly. although there are other duties, certainly. And as we're coming into this election cycle, we are seeing the role of Secretary of State um, different than it mm -hmm. ever has been before due to the last legislative session where it separated out the Secretary of State and the State Board of Elections. And regardless of whether anybody agrees with how that came about, and as a uh, legislative analyst for my former department, I knew all too well what it's like to see an emotionally charged piece of legislation mm -hmm be kind of pushed through I and mean, it failed in committee then was tagged on to another bill and we see that from time to time certainly in government but what we failed to be able to see was a really fully developed piece of legislation that outlined and detailed t's cross i's dotted the protocols and procedures of that split so one of the things that i really was glad to see in that bill was the addition of former county clerks on the state mm -hmm. board of elections and so while it did separate the Secretary of State from the State Board, removed uh, that elected, uh, constitutionally elected uh, position from being a voting voice on the board, although you're an ex officio non-voting member, right. so you still have a voice, just not in a vote, 
and not as chair. Um, it did add these former county clerks on in some capacity, which is still sort of being determined uh, by a judge ruling. And I do think that when we talk about the election process, we're remiss if we don't uh, talk about how important our county clerks right. are because they're the boots on the ground in the trenches every election cycle um, in our communities and they also handle a multitude of other responsibilities mm -hmm. that people don't know about either and so when I think about some of the pros and cons of what happened I think that that addition was definitely a pro mm -hmm. um, the con being you know the Secretary of State is the only elected constitutional officer that's considered the chief election official. Right. You're supposed to be there to be the voice of the people and to have that voice, voting voice, removed from that board I think provides some challenges. Although, as I said earlier in my discussion, being able to have the experience of meeting your objective in a changing environment is vitally important and I have definitely shown that I can transition into that. So I am one that's big on partnerships. Mm -hmm. I believe in being able to go in and work as a team. And so I hope and do feel that with my experience and reputation, I'll still be able to come in as Secretary of State and the Chief Election Official and work diligently with the State Board of Elections and County Clerks to move our election process forward. As you have uh, alluded to, the current Secretary of State and current uh, board at least prior to the addition of the uh, county clerks were in an acrimonious relationship mm -hmm. at, at, uh, to say the least and even the uh, democratic executive director and the current secretary of state were at odds I'm not going to get into all of that but if you're elected will you advocate uh, the legislature restoring the secretary of state uh, as chair of the board or will you wait and, and see how it goes. What will be your position going into the 2020 legislative session if you're elected? Well, the 2020 legislative session, um, unlike the short session, mm -hmm. this session will be uh, really focusing on a budget. Right. So while we will have other issues that come forward, I anticipate that when we talk about uh, restructuring that relationship again, I'm not sure realistically that that would be able to be achieved mm -hmm. in this budget session. I think the primary uh, goal would be to, as you inherit the budget from a, an outgoing Secretary of State, you're there to digest that budget and then see what it does encompass in leading toward the future. And I think we have to immediately look at what type of fiscal help we're giving to our county clerks getting ready for the presidential primary mm -hmm. and general election. So while I would like to see the Secretary of State become a voting member again of the State Board of Elections, I'm not sure, and I'm very pragmatic when I look at things, having the experience in leading government about what it can't and can't happen um, in a short time frame. I'm not sure I see that as a possibility in this particular mm -hmm. session, maybe mm -hmm. in the future. I also think that I'm gonna have to get in there and prove that I am a willing partner in this structure and that even though most of the legislature knows me, having worked with me the last five years, I, know, I think that they're gonna want to watch and see what, um, what atmosphere I set forth as Secretary mm -hmm. of State, and perhaps those things will unfold in, in and of themselves, certainly. But that doesn't mean um, that we can't go in and still be effective under this uh, current dynamic. I do think there are a multitude of other issues that will mm -hmm. be uh, coming up in this legislative session. We've already seen a pre-filed bill for the restoration of voting rights. Right for nonviolent offenders. Where do you stand on that particular um, issue? I do believe that we need to resolve that issue. We're one of the mm -hmm. only states that has not uh, seen some resolution would to that. Would you support an automatic restoration or a process that the individual would have to go through? You know, initially, um, automatic restoration seems to be uh, a majority feel mm -hmm. out there in other mm -hmm. states, although I do understand that there are some concerns uh, with those in that uh, arena that it impacts, that mm -hmm. being, you know, probation, parole, Department of Corrections, and others. And I do believe that we do need to bring all of those people around the table to talk about how can we move this process forward. And perhaps it is in a process-driven model for legislation legislation. One thing I've always advocated for, and I've talked with um, several legislators about this, is when we set forth something like this on our agenda, is to make sure we're getting Republicans, Democrats, everyone around the table, understanding concerns um, and challenges that we may see. And when we put forth a piece of legislation, 
let's identify the exact mm -hmm. process so there's no room for loose interpretation. And if it isn't an automatic restoration, then and, but it is some form of restoration in form of a process, let's go ahead and spell that out with everyone chiming in on what their thoughts and concerns are. I do want to even step further when we talk about restoration voting rights. And when I've had people talk to me about concerns, I even take it a step further because that's what my job was to look at the second and third order effect mm -hmm. of legislative policy. If we don't come to some resolution uh, about this, I think about the family members of those who aren't restored those rights. Um, and again, we're talking about a section, right? Not violent offenders, those mm -hmm. who have been charged with sex crimes or treasonous, even possibly election and bribery, things like that will be taken out of there. But when you think about the children in those households, I mean, we talk about voter engagement mm -hmm. as, you know, the educated population, why aren't young people more involved? Well, it really kind of starts with the family. And are you talking to your family members? I talk to my daughters on a daily basis. I mean, my eldest daughter, uh, registered to vote because we talked to her about her right. eligibility. But when you talk, when you grow up in a household where that's not a part of the discussion, when election day comes and goes, and you have not even noted that it's a special day, are we creating future generations of non-voters because we're not I, we're not addressing this issue for 312,000 Kentuckians that this affects. I don't know, I seem to be a little more um, conscious of those second and third order effects 20 and 30 years down the road. What do we do to engage more people? You, you <laughs> just touched on that. Now, I grew up and I suspect mm -hmm. your, your background it might be similar in that regard to mine. I grew up in a home where every day we talked engagement. Every day, we, we, I grew up on a farm, a rural area, but the political process, the public process was held up it was, was supported, and we were encouraged to uh, be knowledgeable, to watch the news, and to discuss the political process. So what can, we, what can you do as a public office holder uh, to encourage more participation and more interest? In, and, and to some extent, I suppose that is the role to an extent, uh, unwritten maybe, of the Secretary of State. You know, the, anytime you're in a leadership position within government provides you a great platform to be out there in the public um, in a notable way. And it's something I've been very used to the last mm -hmm. 20 years in being able to engage the public um, on veterans and military issues and patriotism and education, certainly. And Secretary of State, you will have a, a wonderful platform to right. be able to partner with whether it's institutions, civic organizations. I know that there are other counties and districts that are right now moving for more engagement within the school systems mm -hmm. about talking to students because when I talk about my daughter Harper, she went to school at Manual, which is one of the larger schools, one of the most notable schools um, in the Commonwealth, but no one had discussed with her her eligibility to vote as a graduating senior at 17, being 18 before the general election, and it was really, on us as a family and you know like you I certainly had parents who engaged in discussion but you know no one in my family was ever asked for a, pa a campaign contribution I don't think early on and being from a small rural area um, you saw people that you knew become leaders in the community mm -hmm. and so you became engaged in that way right. and that discussion and so every election day you knew that it was election day. We took our girls to the polls when they were little and they got their kids vote little sticker and so they understand how important that day is and then fundamentally uh, looking at you know their grandfather um, who was mm -hmm. in Vietnam was shot and bled for this country fighting for democracy and democracy is not a spectator sport you right. know if one if nothing else um, I think people should wake up election day and think of our nation's heroes who have uh, served our country to preserve that democracy. You know, vote for a veteran. I would, one, love to see uh, more veterans engaged in educating mm. young people around the state about why they fought, why they served, and why the right to vote is important to them. And whether it's through a public service announcement, utilizing social media or PSAs on television, 
or going into schools. You know, at KDVA, we help to facilitate getting veteran speakers for Veterans Day and Memorial Day alike. And so I would love to see some of our Kentucky heroes really take a step forward to talk about how important it is for those young people to vote. Sometimes they just need to be reminded. Right. And I do think too often we probably discredit future generations because we assume that they're not interested. But if you think about what we were like at that age mm -hmm. and with all of the technology now that right. they're driven right. and the chaos, what they have, I look at my daughter and you know, one would think at her age that she would not have cared, but I will tell you that once she registered to vote, literally three minutes after I filed for office, which was awesome, um, she came out of the polls that day on election day and of course I had to ask for her vote. I did my due <laughs> diligence, certainly even as a parent, but it was a phenomenal experience to have that with your daughter. She was able to see my name on her ballot for her very first election, but she came out extremely concerned. She said, Mom, I researched everyone else on the ballot. She says, I wanted to make sure I was making an informed decision. And she did that without us telling her, right. make sure you're researching everyone on the ballot. So it gave me some great hope that mm -hmm. perhaps maybe we have got, um, we've got some possible uh, excited generations ahead of us that may have uh, some higher engagement than what we had. Mm -hmm. Do you think Kentucky is prepared going into 2019 and 2020 uh, to handle any future attempts by other nations or uh, other groups that might try to tamper with our electoral process? We're all familiar with the Russian uh, efforts in 2016 and the uh, continued efforts uh, by Russia, some say, as well as other countries and other groups that might mm -hmm. have not just foreign countries, but even interest groups that might have uh, a reason to want to hack into the system itself and uh, certainly the continuing problem of false information and so on. Are we prepared in Kentucky? Well, we certainly do everything to our ability uh, to be able to be proactive and reactive. You know, cybersecurity, as one of the Secretary of States of Iowa said, Cybersecurity is like running a race where there's really not a finish line. Right. It's something that um, I've had experience in working on at KDVA. We had a shared database with Department of Defense um, in drawing down DD-214 forms, which were papers of separation from those who are getting out of the military and coming back home. And so being able to do risk assessments to provide the integrity of your inf digital infrastructure is extremely important. And we do know that there are several people within the Secretary of State's office and the State Board of Elections who have access, Homeland Security access, that get provided real-time cybersecurity threat information, and not only on cybersecurity for our internal issues um, at the state and with our county clerks, but also what's on the horizon, mm -hmm. right? So you have to be reactive, making sure that whatever comes forward and information you're able to and ready to be able to, to thwart, but then you also have to be proactive. What steps can you take in place? And our National Association of Secretaries of States are really um, on the ball when it comes to pounding the pavement in Washington, D.C., making sure we have the greatest information at real time. Um, and then also looking just yesterday, we know that Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook had already identified several uh, entities mm -hmm. of foreign capacity that were wanting to provide possible misinformation in the right. future. So it's just not about the cybersecurity, but as you said, misinformation. And Homeland Security is sort of our go-to department that allows us that internal knowledge to be able to work internally and fix any of those problems. I, for one, would like to see a dedicated personnel um, hired on either through Secretary of State's Office or State Board of Elections, a Chief Information Security Officer, mm -hmm. someone who doesn't really have other duties as assigned, as we all do in government, but someone who is solely dedicated to that process of making sure they're not only being proactive but also reactive to ensure the integrity of our system for the citizens so they know when they go to the polls that their vote counts as they want it to be counted and that no one will be interfering or interacting with that information afterwards. I do know that some county clerks, we're talking right now about transitioning our machines. 
Um, in the last election, we had about 29 counties that had not fully transitioned mm -hmm. to paper right. auditable uh, machines, which is very important. And I know this has been this long saga, right? During my Miss America year, you had the hanging chad. Then right. you right. go to digital because mm -hmm. we wanted to get away from those possibilities. And then you had the whole Russian issue. And then so now everybody's transitioning back to paper. That is an expensive process every time you transition. And so we are still in the throes of making sure we're going to be 100% transition mm -hmm. by fall of 2020 for the presidential election. So we know that there are counties that are concerned about updating software, transitioning those machines. And also with the e-poll books, we have some county clerks that will be just using their e-poll books for the first time in this general election. And that's exciting, but it's also change is kind of right. scary. Right. And, you know, the landscape in Bracken County at the polls may look different than the landscape in Warren County or Taylor County. And so again, making sure that we are fundamentally looking at this whole process in a comprehensive way with all the partners involved and one of those chief partners are our county clerks and making sure we are doing our due diligence in making their communities feel safe and secure in that process. We only have a couple of more minutes mm -hmm. and I wanted to get to a couple of other issues that are certainly when it comes to voting on the table in Kentucky and around the nation. One is the use of voter ID mm -hmm. uh, to allow voters to, to have to show ID if asked. And then secondly, uh, the uh, advocacy of early voting measures of various kinds. What are your positions on those particular matters? So there are really three hot button issues that people in campaigns talk mm -hmm. about when it comes to election reform and legislators too. You know, early voting is right. one of those, no excuse absentee voting, mm -hmm. um, and then photo ID. Oh, and the extension of voting hours. Right. So really four. Right. So in talking with the county clerks, you know, I personally would love to see early voting. You know, as a, a working mom, you know, getting your kids to school, commuting to work, then getting done. And if you work for an employer that doesn't give you paid leave, they may they give you leave, but may not paid leave. By the time you get home at six o'clock, have you had a chance to vote? I, I do think early voting is is possible, certainly, and, and there are a lot of county clerks that feel like they can handle that responsibility. But if there are county clerks that can't, what can we as a state do to help subsidize that? We do have about 39 states around us that do offer early voting. Um, no excuse absentee voting. I, I'm for no excuse absentee voting. However, in talking with the county clerks again, from their perspective, they consider absentee voting, in, even in its current form, um, a, a opportunity, a, a higher opportunity for voter fraud. And it really stems from our long-term nursing care facilities. Yeah. And I do know, having run um, and been a part of running for long-term nursing care facilities, I can certainly see where their concern comes in if people are assisting those individuals filling that out. Is that person dictating a little more what's gonna be filled out on that ballot? Um, and so I think that we may need to work to figure out how we can secure that process uh, even as it is now. Extension of voting hours, you know, that is something of extreme concern to our county clerks because they mm -hmm. have a hard time getting poll workers from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. I would love to see two additional hours, but again, it talks about the fiscal impact for those county clerks. That might be something in the future I'd like to see done, but again, in partnership with them. Um, and then voter ID, we're talking really about um, you know, we do offer many different forms of identification right now at the polls. I, for one, always show my license, but we do know across America there's 21 million um, eligible voters that don't have an ID. And at the cost of about $40 per person to be able to get that, we talk again about the fiscal impact, but you're talking about three different populations of people and one most notably our senior citizens. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of our senior citizens don't have photo IDs because they don't drive anymore. So again, being able to provide a process that's fair, equitable, affordable, and accessible is extremely important when we talk about that. We're out of time. I'm sorry, I know fine. there's Thank so much so information. Much. Yeah. This is uh, John Schelling for Dialogue on P Public Issues with. Heather French Henry, the Democratic nominee for our Secretary of State. And thank you so much for being with us today. Wish thank you Godspeed you. and safety out on the campaign trail. We encourage all the voters to uh, study the candidates, issues, and make informed choices. And please vote on Tuesday, November 5th.